You can get a ride. That might be. Let's see if she texted. All right, Israel, does it doesn't look like that thing is uh, working? She did not text, so I don't know uh, what's going on. Let's go right in. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Have, we have Mark sick this morning with flu-like symptoms. Hopefully it's not, not the disease that shall not be spoken. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we'll be praying for Mark and that he'll start feeling better and be able to get back to church, back to work. And I'm going to fill, fill in for him this morning. Uh, it was kind of weird. I was on, uh, not vacation, but visiting family these last couple days and trying to put a lesson together for this Sunday. And it seemed like a, it was just really hard to focus and get everything done. And I was thinking, man, I'm going to have to pull out an old lesson or an old sermon and just kind of microwave something and for this Sunday I'll probably have to do because it was getting down to Friday and then Saturday and and I hate doing that I like to have new stuff as best as I can and there's nothing wrong with redoing an old lesson but I personally just don't don't like to do that uh, so anyway praying about it and uh, the Lord gave me a sermon for this morning that I'll preach and then uh, last night uh, Mark texted me and said he wasn't gonna be able to be here this morning so I was like oh no now I gotta get another thing ready <laughs> and actually it was interesting the Lord gave me another lesson that I've been wanting to do for years I've just never done it and so I ended up with uh, two original lessons in one day that's uh, amazing for me because yeah exactly it is the Lord it's uh, not me it's the Lord but it normally takes me a whole week to put one of these things together, and I got two done in one day, so praise the Lord. All right, let's pray, and we'll get started. Father, I come before you this morning, and thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for uh, your people here this morning, and thank you, God, for the people that are tuning in and that are going to be watching this and listening to this and all, wherever this is going to go, Lord. You said, cast our bread upon the waters. We don't know where it's going to go, Father, but we're just going to put it out there and let you do with it what you will. And I pray that it be an edification to your people, an encouragement. I pray, Father, that you would remind your people that this book is your book, and it's still... Uh, it's still the book that God, uh, as Dr. Ruckman said, tells the sun to shine and, and tells uh, the world when to get up and when to go to bed and everything. This book runs the world. And so I just pray, Father, that you'd help us to re uh, remember that this morning. And I pray that uh, you'd bless the lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a lesson on the, on the uh, history and prophecy hidden in the seven days of creation. And I showed how the basically how the seven days of creation bore a remarkable resemblance to some of the major events in mankind's history. And if you remember, I pointed out a bizarre phenomenon in the Bible where God will do thing do a thing one way, and then he'll repeat it backwards. And it's kind of like a mountain climber is what I likened it to, how a mountain climber, if he's moving forward, he starts at the bottom level, and then he goes up to the next level, the next, and the next, and the next, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until he gets to the top, let's say. And then as he continues down the mountain, he goes in a similar fashion, except backwards. He goes seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, to the bottom. And we saw that these events have a tendency to repeat but in a backwards fashion. And I mentioned at that time that I knew of another lesson that was like that, or another, another thing in the Bible like that, and I'm going to show you that today. Uh, this pattern today has to do with the major global events of Earth's history. And this morning I'm going to take you through these events. I'm going to take for granted that you're aware of most of the Bible stories and these significant Bible stories, so we're not going to have time to go into the details of every one of these events, but <clears throat> we're going to go kind of as a general overview. And as I said in the lesson that I did that's kind of like this, I'm not necessarily trying to cherry pick certain events out of world history to try to match them up so that my theory fits or anything like that. We're taking major events from the Bible and we're just going to see if, uh, if they match up and see if there's a pattern here. And if there's no pattern, I'm not interested in forcing one, but I think there is a pattern here and I'll let you be the judge. All right, so if you remember, uh, what is the most monumental event of world history? I mean, there's just no question. The most significant event of world history. 
if you need a clue, it's not the death of Princess Diana. Uh, <laughs> it's not the election of Donald Trump. It's not the, uh, 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 the invention of sliced bread or the ending of slavery. The most important significant event uh, of the world is Calvary. And that's the coming of God's Son to the earth. That is, God the Creator comes to the world in the form of a human being. That is a... A monumentally significant event. Even to this day, as you know, uh, well, I guess up until just a few years ago, the our time, our entire calendar was based on the coming of the Son of God. This is what we would call the first advent. Anno Domini means the year of our Lord. That's A.D. and then B.C. is before Christ. Or, but uh, then they changed this to uh, B.C.E. in the public schools now, and that means before the Common Era. <laughs> you know, to take Christ out of the calendar. But uh, you know, that's typical of the public educational system. It's, I still go with A.D. and B.C. So. So all of time surrounds that moment, and uh, uh, that is appropriate. That's the first advent. And like I said, that, um, that time is going to include the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. That, that right there is the most significant event in world history. And uh, there are six major world events that lead up to this event, this event being the seventh. And then after this event, there are six major world events that follow it. And uh, I'm going to show you how these things might have a correlation. Now, I want to label this first event. I'm going to label this one as salvation. Okay. Okay. You'll see where I'm going with this here in a little bit. Now, the way I'm going to do this lesson this morning is I'm going to go and start from the beginning, and then we'll get up to Calvary, and then we'll go back, then we'll go beyond Calvary. But uh, the first thing that we have here in the history of these events is essentially uh, the creation of the earth. Genesis 1-1, right? The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, Okay. So we have the creation of the earth, and I don't know how much of the earth was water, how much was land back in Genesis 1-1, but we're just going to say Genesis 1-1, and we have the creation back there at the beginning of earth's history. And you have to admit, that's a pretty significant event, significant event in the history of the world, the creation of the earth. <laughs> All right. And then uh, right here you have, let's see, I want to go with a different color. After the creation of the world in Genesis 1-1, what's the most, uh, probably, there's a real significant event that happens after that. Well, you have, uh, I guess, a more appropriate term. It, there is a flood, but uh, it is the uh, flooding in Genesis 1-2, where it says that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. All right, so you have the destruction, essentially, of the creation there in Genesis 1-2. That's what we would call the gap theory, if you will. Uh, that's uh, what we would refer to at the timing of when Lucifer fell from heaven and resulted in that destruction of the earth. Come on in. Good to see you this morning. So we have uh, the destruction there given in Genesis 1-2, where it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon, upon the face of the deep. God didn't create it that way. God creates things perfect. He never creates things as a blob and then lets them evolve over time and things like that. God creates the thing right, and then it got destroyed. And then uh, you have essentially the recreation or the restoration of the earth here in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 through 31. All right, so you have the six days of essentially recreation. And basically, you remember we went through that in the, on the first day, God created light, you know, and on the uh, second day, God separated the waters from the waters. And then on the uh, third day, God created uh, the dry land. And then on the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And on the fifth day, God created uh, the... Uh, uh, trying to draw and think of this at the same time. He created the animals, right? On the sixth day, God created man, right? And then uh, on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. Now, what's interesting, if you look there in Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 1, this is just a side note, 
But uh, Genesis chapter 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Right? And then over in uh, Genesis 2, it talks about these are the generations, right, of the heaven and the earth, heavens and the earth when they were made. Is that what it says there, if I'm not mistaken? Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So it's interesting that Genesis 1-1 says that God created, and then Genesis chapter 2 says that God made the, the universe, essentially. Now, what's the difference there? Well, when it comes to creation, God is... If you go through that, throughout the Bible, this is a whole other study, but when God creates, it involves His mouth. It involves Him speaking something and it coming into existence. That's how He created the heaven and the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Later on, when it was destroyed, God made the earth and all the, th and the things that are therein in the universe. But made has to do with God's hands. Basically, he took pre-existing materials and he formed it and he built it, like uh, the Bible talks about. Uh, like a person would build a house. You don't speak it into existence. You build it with pre-existing materials. That was what happened in Genesis chapter 1, 3 through 31. And then uh, when it comes to the creation aspect that went on at that time, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he, was, he became a living soul. That was a man becoming created. All right, So that's a whole other study for another time. The next major significant event, obviously you have uh, you know, the creation, the fall of man, all that going on right there. The next uh, major significant event you read about, as far as the earth is concerned, not so much mankind, but the earth itself, uh, is going to be basically the flood of Noah. Okay, Because you have Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man, and then you have uh, some family disputes going on. You have Cain killing Abel. You know, and then in chapter 5, you have a big, long genealogy that gives you the generations from Adam, you know, all the way down to Noah. And uh, then you have the story in Genesis chapter 6 where God says the world is corrupt and every thought of their heart was uh, only evil continually. And so God drowns out the earth. You remember that. And you remember that at that time, uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives, all which they chose. And and uh, all that craziness going on that uh, they like to report about on the History Channel on their Ancient Aliens TV show. All right, all the pre-flood stuff. Interesting. All right, and then uh, after the flood, that's the fl so the flood is going to be Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 7, and uh, they come out Genesis chapter 8. And then uh, you read about something, or Genesis chapter 8 is the flood. Genesis chapter 9, they're coming out. God tells them to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, just like he told Adam. But he's telling that to Noah and his sons. Okay? And after that, you have Genesis chapter 10, where it talks about all the, uh, the children that were being had by Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then you get to Genesis chapter 11. And the next uh, real globally significant event that takes place has to do with uh, this tower that mankind is wanting to build. You remember that in Genesis chapter 11? Babel. Babel, exactly. Now Babel, I, I just there's not a lot of information given there in Genesis chapter 11, but you start comparing Scripture with Scripture, and you start looking up what they were doing, and why they were doing it, and why... One of the things that, I've always, that is an interesting question is, what's the big deal if they were just trying to build a big tower? I mean, do you think that thing was bigger than the Burj Dubai over, uh, you know, that, that, that thing? That's the biggest tower in the world. I mean, you look at a skyline of, uh, of that area, Dubai, and you see these tall buildings, and then there's one building that's almost double the size of all the other buildings. That thing's huge. So it, does God just not like skyscrapers, you know, and that's why he came down and confounded the world? Is that the big problem? But then if that's the case, did uh, man just keep building skyscrapers after that? And finally the Lord is like, ah, oh, you know what, forget it. <laughs> They're just going to keep building those things. They're not going to mess them up every time they try. You know? No, obviously not. There's something going on there that was really bad. The, the world was trying to get together as usual, and when the world gets together, they become defiant towards the Lord. And uh, so God had told the people to replenish the earth, but instead they said, let us build us a name and a tower lest, lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. So there was a form of rebellion going on there, but then uh, God ended up setting some boundaries. And I was just reading this this morning, and maybe someday I'll do a lesson. I'll just mention it this morning, since it might be a year before I ever get this lesson put together. But in Acts chapter 17, look at this really quick. 
I just think this is really interesting. I was, you know, you always read about, you know, Acts chapter 17, and Paul is preaching to these Athenians, and he's saying, hey, you guys got too many gods. You're real superstitious. You're so superstitious that just in case you missed a god, you've got this statue set up for the unknown god. And, uh, and so he's saying, you guys got all these gods. You know, he's down in the Agora, down by Greece. Uh, and then he goes up to Mars Hill and starts speaking to the Athenians. And they, all they want to do is hear some new thing. And, and he says, uh, you know what? God is uh, not worshipped with men's hands, Acts 17.25, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And it says, And he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You know, I've always read that bounds of their habitation, and applied that to, okay, that's going back to the Tower of Babel. God separated the nations. He determined the bounds of every nation, and the different various countries, if you will, and the families and the tribes, to keep them separate. They had different languages. God wanted them to stay separate. Why? So that they would tend to seek after the Lord. Because when the nations of the world start intermixing and intermarrying, there's a tendency for them to depart from God. That's just a human nature, law of, na of human nature. But it occurred to me this morning, well, what about that phrase, the times before appointed? What in the world is that talking about? And I got looking up some of that stuff and reading some of that stuff. And uh, uh, like I said, I won't go into it this morning because there's some interesting things there. But it gets into... Uh, a change that happened here in, at this time, and, and it has to do with uh, uh, something that significant that took place. I write about it in a book I wrote called The Doctrine of the Doors, where man was trying to get the angels to come back down, and that's why God had to stop it. And what did God do? There might be a double application of that verse. God set the bounds at that point. Prior to that point, during the time of uh, from Adam all the way to the flood, angels and men lived side by side. Exactly, and there was a there's all this these giants starting to come about, and there was an intermingling that God was not pleased with. Um, man was trying to recreate that at the Tower of Babel, and God stopped it, and He determined the bounds of their habitation. I've always thought that that just refers to the nations, but what if that refers to the bounds of the human race? God God closed off the bounds from from heaven and earth, and there's no. Man cannot break through to those angels, and those angels cannot, in my opinion, we discussed this a little bit this morning with Brother Rowley, break through down to men. And that whole Genesis 6 thing, God has set the times of, of that thing. He's appointed the times. He's set the bounds. There's a boundary there. And the mystery of iniquity was that an evil entity coming in the form of a human being. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he that now letteth will let. He that preventing that thing until he be taken out of the way. What happens when that thing's taken out of the way? Satan incarnate comes. All of a sudden you have angels and men mixing again. You have beings in the form of human beings walking on the earth in the tribulation. So it's interesting. I wonder if the bounds of those habitations have to do with the separation of the spiritual realm from the physical and man from angels. Well, that's an interesting thing. And you say, well, that's kind of far-fetched. Yeah, kind of. But then again, in Acts chapter 17, the entire context is man worshiping the gods. So that's kind of interesting. I just thought that was interesting. Like I said, one of these days I'll go through that a little bit more slowly and go through all the scriptures on that. But I was just reading that this morning and I thought, oh, that's, that's, there's something there. All right. Now, after the Tower of Babel... Uh, you, there are not too many globally significant events. I mean, after, in, after Babel in Genesis 11, you know, you start reading in Genesis chapter 12, and you start reading about uh, a nobody who lives over in the Ur of the Chaldees, okay? Uh, other than the Bible, you don't read about Abraham anywhere. You don't read about inscriptions to Abraham. You don't read about these, you know, Abraham was some great man. No, he was just a righteous man who lived over in Ur of the Chaldees. I mean, if we didn't have the Bible record, would anybody know anything about Abraham? No. <laughs> Abraham was nobody. You read about this man, you know, he, he goes on a trip. You know, he goes on a road trip. And uh, while he's on his road trip, he has some problems along the way. And, you know, this guy, he has a wife, and she has a hard time having a baby. And, you know, then him and his nephew get into this fight. And eventually he ends up having a kid, and then his kid ends up, uh, you know, having to have a servant go and find a wife for him in the land, and the wife comes back, you know, and they end up getting married. And then he ends up having a kid, and his kid ends up having 12 kids, and one of his kid, and his kid, you know, ends up 
uh, putting some some fur and deceives his father, and then he goes and you know find marries two women, has twelve kids, and then uh, he gets ripped off, you know, in a business deal. Who cares? <laughs> you know, from the standpoint of the world, you know, you read this stuff, and it's like, what does that have to do with anything? Why is God? You think about all the things that are going on in the world that God could have talked about. You know, the the Chinese dynasties, you know, the Trojan War, all these amazing the the uh, Remus and Romulus maybe, and the foundation of the Roman Empire. What? There's all these things you could talk. About about, you know, the building of the Parthenon in Greece or what, and here he's talking about a couple of shepherds in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. As far as the earth is concerned, as my dad, with his, in his Boston accent, Boston accent would say, who he is? <laughs> who he is? <laughs> but God cares, and obviously as Bible believers, we know the significance of those events that were recorded in Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 50 and so on. But uh, it's interesting, the way God records his book. You know, the entire world yawns at uh, the word of God, and <laughs> there's actually a lot of significant things going on. The world just never knew. The world didn't know that stuff was going on. But, uh, you know, kingdoms rose and they fell throughout Old Testament history. And, you know, there's decent significance to some of those kingdoms. But even so, the rise and fall of all these various empires, that's just the same typical cyclical history that uh, the earth has seen a million times. You know, the earth, you take the earth, it's seen so many kingdoms rise and fall and come and go. No big deal. All right. And so... uh, Really, if you were to point to the next event after Babel, you know, that's really significant as far as the earth is concerned. Uh, The next event, really, that uh, I would argue would be over in Exodus chapter 19. Go ahead and turn there, if you will. Exodus chapter 19. Now, something happened on Exodus in Exodus chapter 19 that was pretty significant and unique. Not something that uh, happens every day, you might say. (laughs) Exodus chapter 19, and if you would, look at uh, verse 16. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16. All right. It says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And look at verse 20. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. Moses went up. So you have this thing of Mount Sinai where God himself, the creator, once again is coming down and he is descending upon Mount Sinai. Now the Lord had come and visited Abraham and and wrestled with Jacob and had done some various things, but it was always kind of an incognito thing, you know, showing up as the angel of the Lord. Um, here, and, and also you remember in Egypt, God, mankind had seen God's power and his miracles. But here at Sinai, God is coming down and the whole mountain is quaking. And this is God himself coming down to the earth in the plain open sight of mankind. That's a pretty big deal. And he ends up giving the world his word, his written word. And that in and of itself is a big deal, too. For the first time in history, other than the account written by Elihu of the book of Job, I mean, you had that. But for the first time, God is writing his words in stone. He, with his own hand, is writing his words in stone. And these things are able to be read, seen, copied, recorded, preached. This is a big deal. This is a major change in world history. All right? And uh, most of the interactions with God prior to that time were mostly just visions, dreams, or personal visitations. This event had to do with a nation, and the things that God gave to Israel were so that they could be a light to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world. And if Israel would obey the laws that God had given them, the Gentiles would see the blessings upon the Jews and say, you know, God is with you. And they would recognize that, and it would be a light that would draw the nations to Israel and consequently draw them to God. So this event of Mount Sinai is a uh, remarkable event as far as world history goes. 
and God made His will known to man in the form of written words. So that's pretty significant. Now, the rest of history uh, has to do with one nation and their failure to obey God, and, and then they end up going into captivity because of their sin, and then they end up returning out of captivity, and you read about this one nation on the earth, out of all the nations of the earth, you read about the this one little nation, you know, through the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the prophets. That's what the rest of your Bible is talking about, this one little nation, you know, and how they just kept blowing it and how God kept trying to reach out to them and keep rejecting the prophets and all this stuff. That's all you read about. Not really globally significant as far as the earth is concerned. Now, we're back to the first advent, okay? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're back to the first advent, as I mentioned, globally significant event. And uh, the next big monumental thing uh, that, you would, that has global implications and has had global implications after uh, Calvary and the resurrection, I'm just going to draw it like this, even though this is not exactly the case, and I'll explain why in a second. But uh, what you have here is the church and the church age. And you say, well, is that really globally significant? And the answer is yes. I mean, what you have here is you have the formation of the body of Christ. Okay. Now, I drew a church building. Just for the record, the body of Christ is not a church building or a denomination. Okay. If you don't go to a church building or you're not a member of a local Baptist church, that doesn't mean that you're not part of the body of Christ. That's a Baptist brighter doctrine. We don't believe that. That's unbiblical. And that's ridiculous. Um, but anyway, we won't get into all that this morning. But I drew a church just so you'd recognize what I'm talking about is the church, the body of Christ. Okay, So the body of Christ comes along and gets going. And what you have is you have a new creation on the earth. You have a, basically almost a new species of mankind. You have Prior to that, you always had uh, just regular people that were sinners you know, and were under bondage to sin. But after Calvary, when people accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, here you have this human entity that has God Almighty inside of them. That didn't happen in the Old Testament. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. The, the, the humans that trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior are different from those who don't. There's a huge difference. If you say an unsaved person is here and a saved person is here, they might look the same on the outside, but one of them has the God of the universe inside of them. That's pretty significant. That's pretty interesting. All right. And those people, those saved people, have the power of the resurrection within them and the ability to overcome sin and do, thing, do all things that please the Father. That's hugely remarkable as far as the earth is concerned. All right. And furthermore, at this time, you had the recording of Scripture. Okay, So you have the New Testament being written. So you have the Old Testament being written back here with Sinai, and the New Testament being written right here with the church. Okay. Now, if you notice, like I said, these things are going to start repeating themselves, and what you've got here is the Scriptures and the Scriptures. Old Testament, New Testament. The nation of Israel, the church. You're going to start seeing that thing start replicating itself, but we'll get into it in just a minute. Now, there are uh, a number of things that happen over the next 2,000 years of world history that you and I might label as globally significant. Things such as perhaps the rise and fall of the unholy Roman Empire. You know, the discovery of America, Christopher Columbus, you know, the Declaration of Independence, the invention of the Internet. You know, there's all kinds of things that, uh, that have pretty globally uh, uh, importance, you know, World War I, World War II. But the Bible doesn't record any of those events. God skips all of that and starts picking up the record of history again. I mean, when you're talking about history and historical events and chronological record, it ends with Acts 28. And then you've got a bunch of epistles. And then the chronological record picks up again in the future <laughs> with the book of Revelation. And the, then it starts detailing the events that are going to be happening in history during the book of Revelation. Okay, So God skips all that, skips all of Earth's history for about 2,000 years, picks up in the future when the Revelation begins. And there you read about the whole world starting to come together once again and form a global world government that's run by a religious feminine evil spirit. 
It's not to say that females are evil or the feminine spirit is necessarily bad, but this particular thing in Revelation chapter 17, it's a devil of some sort that's run the kingdoms of the earth, and it's a feminine spirit described as Mystery Babylon. All right? Mystery Babylon. Now, Mystery Babylon is pretty significant. You have the woman that sits on seven hills, and basically the thing about uh, Mystery Babylon is... It, uh, it runs the kings of the earth. And the other thing is, is God, you, you would think, well, why is, why is she so important? You know, why is this woman uh, so important? <laughs> I don't know. I, as a girl there. But uh, she sits on the kingdoms of the earth. And uh, you say, well, why is that so important? Well, God finds it important. He spends entire chapters in the Old and New Testament talking about this female wicked spirit, Jeremiah 51 and 52, and Revelation 17 and 18, and then various places all throughout the rest of the Bible. This is the culmination of, of, of a wicked spirit that's been persecuting his people since the time of at least the Tower of Babel, maybe even back to the time of Cain. And uh, furthermore, you know, God gives almost an entire verse of Scripture with capital letters talking about this thing. No other verse in Scripture has all capital letters talking about anything in particular. I mean, this uh, Revelation 17, 5 says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And it says that in her is found the blood of all the saints and martyrs. So she's a big deal. And uh, that spirit's been over the kings of the earth since Nimrod, and the elimination of that spirit... When that occurs in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, that has major global implications and major global significance. Now, you may have noticed that I left out the rapture, and I'll come back to that. There's a reason for that. Um, the next great thing that follows the destruction, and the other thing about the destruction of Mystery Babylon, I mean, maybe to us we're really like, well, I don't know, is it really that important? I mean, but the thing is, God has all these alleluias in heaven. Heaven is rejoicing. I mean, heaven rejoices when someone gets saved, and heaven rejoices when Babylon gets burned to the ground. <laughs> Those are some things that heaven is rejoicing over. And so that's a big deal. All right, now the next big thing that follows is uh, the, the, the uh, tribulation period. All right, the tribulation period, you have Satan incarnate, on the earth in the form of the Antichrist. This uh, great tribulation period is three and a half years, and that is a hugely globally significant event with uh, all kinds of things happening, the seas turning into blood, uh, comets falling to the earth, volcanoes exploding, basically all just kind of uh, havoc going on on the earth. And you've got the devil in the form of a man on the earth just wiping people out left and right. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, that would be a big deal if you had Satan incarnate as a man. The Bible says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come unto you, having great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time, right? All right, so that's a major global event. Now, let me just point something out real quick. I put the chronological placement of the destruction of Mystery Babylon before the three and a half years of the Antichrist. I don't know if you necessarily picked up on that, but most Bible scholars, Bible teachers... Everybody puts the destruction of Mystery Babylon at the end of the tribulation period. And it's, there's a few verses in the Bible that, understandably, that's maybe why you would think that, was, that is where it goes. But if you put the destruction of Mystery Babylon at the end of the tribulation period, as far as a chronological order of the events of the tribulation, it creates all kinds of uh, contradictions and all kinds of uh, chronological problems. I noticed that when I was trying to figure out the chronology of the tribulation period and the events that take place. And it's always been really hard to place the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Uh, even authors that put it there, you know, acknowledge that there's a few things that don't really add up. Okay? So, uh, the timing of the destruction of Mystery Babylon is always, you know, the monkey wrench in the prophetic timeline. If you, if you try to figure that thing out, you can see where you could use some verses to say, well, it goes right here, but there's also a lot of verses that prove that it goes right here. Me, myself, I'm 100% convinced that the destruction of Mystery Babylon takes place essentially at the beginning of the Great Tribulation period. When the Antichrist rises from the dead, the first thing he does is him and his ten kings destroy that religious spirit that uh, basically is bringing in the kingdoms of the earth under a one global religion. He destroys global religion. 
Yeah, we'll be gone for all that. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring. I'll mention that in a minute, in a little bit. He dis, the Antichrist, as Satan incarnate, destroys global religion. You say, well, why would he do that? Well, because global religion worships an unseen God. He declares that he himself is God, and the woman rides the beast. And he's not going to have her riding him for three and a half years. <laughs> he kicks her off. It's Satan. Satan runs the show. And f so he burns down Mystery Babylon. Her destruction is in one hour. And uh, a bunch of other things happen, but we won't go into all that right now. So that's my, my belief on that. If, if you disagree, that's fine. But uh, the next major significance, significant event that you read about there in the Bible is the return of Jesus Christ. Okay? And uh, he sits down and he's king of kings and lord of lords and he sits upon his throne there in Jerusalem and this is uh, just a throne here in Jerusalem okay and basically he's king he destroys the antichrist and his armies at the battle of Armageddon and then he sits down on the throne of David and he rules and reigns the bible says for a thousand years on the earth and his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness and justice and judgment and uh, he makes the earth great again mega Make the earth great again. Amen. All right? <laughs> and then you have, after the millennium, if you'll remember, you have uh, Revelation 20, verse 11, where uh, it's talking about the destruction of the heavens and the earth. And it says, uh, the heavens... Uh, what is that? How does that go? Revelation 20, 11. It's slipping my mind at the moment. Revelation 20, 11. I'm thinking of the verse... Go ahead. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, oh, yeah. who faced the earth, and they had to put away, and there was no place down to die. Right. Revelation 20.11. Okay, so that's the destruction of the heaven and the earth. The earth and the heaven fled away. Okay, and there's found no place for them. And the Bible talks about the elements melting with a fervent heat, and so that thing goes away. Question. Yep. So the elements, that was the question I had for you. The elements melting in the fervent heat, that doesn't happen when he comes the day of the Lord. That's a good question, because I'm glad you, you noticed that, because the verses that talk about the elements melting with a fervent heat, a lot of the context is the second advent. And there's mountains that are melting, and, there's all, and there's, he's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance of them that know not God. And so there is a lot of burning, there's a lot of things melting. And so it's interesting that those verses are within the context of the second advent. There seems to be another application where the actual atoms, the atomic structure of the universe melts with the fervent heat at the end of the tribulation, or the end of the millennium, and, every, and earth and heaven just scatter. Because right now all things are upheld by the word of His power, the Bible says. And so when God, the, those atoms, you know, those electrons, they don't even know why those electrons spin around the atom. They don't know what holds those things together. And it's God. It's His word holding it together. And so when He says to let that thing depart, you could say that even the elements... When we think of elements, we're, we as 21st century Americans, we're thinking about the periodic table and stuff like that. I'm not sure if that's necessarily what the word elements is referring to there in the scripture, but either way, this thing is going to blow apart in Revelation 2011, and there's also going to be a great fire that's going to burn the elements of uh, the earth at the second advent also. So. so what's the earth going to be like during the millennium? Is it going to be restored to... I mean, is it still going to be cursed? No, that, well, that's a great question. There is going to be the curse because sin is still going to be present. Curse, the sin, sin is what cursed the earth in Genesis oh, chapter 3. So sin is, yeah, sin is still there. People are still dying. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, which has to occur over here because the Bible talks about the child in the millennium shall die 100 years old. So if people are still dying, the wages of sin is death. There's still sin in the millennium. Things are restored, like you said, but uh, there's still, the curse is not entirely lifted. It may be subdued to a certain extent, but it's not fully lifted. So that's a really good point, too, and I'll actually get to that in a second. And then uh, finally, here in, uh, here, right, uh, in Revelation 21 and 22, you have uh, the creation. I, I draw water here. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be the case because it says there was no more sea, although that could be referring to the deep and outer space. Okay, but uh, it says that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, right? Where we dwell with righteousness. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Yeah, it's going to be great. And it's going to be sinless, the way this one was originally and was supposed to be. Okay? Now, like I said, I left out the rapture. Oh, wait, hold on. Now, before I get into that, let me point something out here. 
So you have six globally significant events before Calvary. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then six significant events after. One, two, three, four, five, six. I know that adds up to 13, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, that's all I could come up with. You know, if you can think of some more, that's fine. I might actually have one more for you, and I'll show you in a second. But now I want to show you something. Notice these connections. Like I said, God has this weird phenomenon in the Bible where he's, He does a thing one way, and then He repeats it backwards. So here at the, at the zenith, you have salvation. All right? And I, I drew that too big. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo that because that's too big. I'm a, I don't have OCDC, but sometimes little details bother me. Okay, so now right here, so you have salvation at Calvary. Now what I'm going to call this period right here is Revelation. I find this interesting. You have, like I said, the Old Testament and the New Testament with the church age and uh, the Old Testament Jews and them becoming a nation. Okay, And then you have the Tower of Babel and you have Mystery Babylon. Okay, You say, what is that? That's integration. You have the peoples of the world coming together again. They're all together under Mystery Babylon. One world religion, one world government, one world this, one world that, globalism, new world order. That was what you have back here in the Tower of Babel. Furthermore, what's interesting, like I said, the Tower of Babel, I suspect, had something to do with getting the sons of God to come back down. Mystery Babylon is destroyed by ten kings that are not human. The angels have come down again, and they burn her up. So there's something weird going on there. All right. Then you have uh, the flood matched up with the Great Tribulation, which is appropriate because Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Right? All right. And uh, it says that uh, the world is not is going to be the worst time the world's ever seen, and he compares it to the time of the flood. All right. And I'm going to call this right here Tribulation. Okay? Tribulation. Three and a half year tribulation likened to the flood. All right? The next one, like Sabina was so astutely pointed out, took my word, you have the Garden of Eden, and you have the Millennium, and what you have is a restoration. The Garden of Eden is a restoration of something that was destroyed just prior. And the Millennium is a restoration of the earth of something that was destroyed just prior. And you know what's interesting is the Bible uses the phrase without form and void in Genesis 1-2 and then it's restored in, uh, Ge in Genesis chapter 3. And then over in the only other time in your Bible where that specific phrase without form and void shows up is in Jeremiah chapter 4 and it's in the context of the second advent. The tribulation, the earth, for all practical purposes, like back here, is without form and void, and then it's restored in the millennium. Now, there is a theory by G.H. Pember that the without form and void in Jeremiah chapter 4 is referring to uh, the earth prior to, you know, the, and the inhabitants of the earth prior to Genesis 1 2 and Satan and his angels and all this stuff. But uh, it's an interesting theory, and there may be some truth to it, but talking about the pre Adamic civilizations on the earth, but. I don't buy Pember's theory all the way because he puts dinosaurs back there and he says that's where the fossils come from. These dead dinosaurs you dig up, those are from back here. Uh, he has these ancient civilizations that people are digging up, the pyramids and all that stuff. Well, that's from back here, an angelic civilization. And the geologic strata of the earth that says millions and millions of years, that therefore explains where those come from because that's back here. Uh, I'm not fully convinced that that's the case. I think most of that stuff can be explained by the flood of Noah, and I don't think it's necessary to put a massive pre-Adamic civilization with mercantile trading and stuff back before Genesis 1-2. Uh, the verses that are used there in Ezekiel to prove all that aren't talking about that at all. It's just that those are loose connections that are tried to link back there. So maybe there's some truth to that. And if you've heard of that theory, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know, if you haven't heard of that theory, you're probably like, what is he even talking about? <laughs> but for those of you that are aware of that, that's kind of where that thing fits in. And I'm not fully sold on it. I'll just, I'll just put that there. There was Satan and his angels in the world prior, uh, in the Genesis 1-1 earth. I, I believe that. But, you, but to put death 
back there where you have flesh and blood creatures that are dying and being buried and their bones are in the earth. I have a problem with that because death came with Adam, uh, according to the book of Romans chapter 5. So, like I said, that's got its problems. Uh, but it's interesting that you have without form and void, restoration. Without form and void, Jeremiah 4, restoration. All right, then the next one you have uh, destruction. Destruction with uh, Genesis 1, 2 and Revelation 20, 11. You have the destruction of the creation and the destruction of the creation. You know how there's a lot of Christians that don't believe in this gap theory over here. They, th they don't believe it at all. You know one way that I know there has to be a gap there? <laughs> there has to be a destruction there? Because there's a destruction right there. This is how God does His book. The fact that it's destroyed there, if, it wa if there was no gap theory, there'd be nothing for this to correspond to. That's one way I know the gap theory is right, because these two things match up perfectly. And then you have, finally, we're running out of time, you have right here, perfection. In the beginning in Genesis 1, 1, things were perfect. And then over here in Revelation uh, 21 and 22, things are once again perfect, except you don't have to worry about anyone sinning or any cherubims falling or any more sin after that. Okay, And that's a whole other subject for another time. So you got seven things. Salvation, revelation, integration, tribulation, restoration, destruction, perfection. And the thing just duplicates itself as you go out in history. You see that? I find that really interesting. Now lastly, one last real quick note. It was I mentioned I didn't put the rapture in there. I could put the rapture in there, and I've wondered if maybe I should, and I'll tell you where it would fit. The rapture, you could probably argue, is a pretty globally significant event. I mean, Christians disappearing off the earth. But then again, I don't know. I, sort of, I sometimes wonder if the world is even going to know we're gone. <laughs> maybe a few of the people right around us will recognize that we're gone. But sometimes I wonder if the whole earth is going to even care or even wonder. Maybe there's going to be a global cataclysm, a World War III or something. They'll just figure, oh, well, they probably died of COVID-19, or they probably got blown up in the nuclear explosion, or whatever happens, you know, whatever. Who knows? Maybe they'll just, uh, I don't know how they're going to explain the disappearance of all these people. There's a lot of theories, and they're interesting, but you'd put the rapture right there. And uh, the rapture, uh, according to, well, what's going to happen is God is going to take his people out of the world. Now, if that is an event that's going to correspond on this timeline, there has to be something right here that corresponds with God taking his people out of something, which we actually do have. Right between the Babel and Sinai, we have God taking his people out of Egypt, a type of the world. And in Revelation chapter 8, or not Revelation, but Romans chapter 8, the Bible uh, says that when this rapture happens, it has a term for it. It's the redemption of our bodies. Redemption is a Bible word that means delivered. We're delivered from the corruption of sin and death. And in Deuteronomy, the Bible talks about, in 30, 13 verse 5, uh, God, when He took them out of Egypt, He redeemed them out of the house of bondage. So if I was going to match the rapture with the Exodus, I would call that the redemption. Come on in. Good seeing you this morning. All right. Uh, so there you have it. There is essentially uh, God's global event pattern. The thing begins and duplicates itself out. And like I said, that's a phenomenon that you find in the Bible. You don't find that in the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, or any of these other Book of Mormon, or any of that garbage. This is something that tells you that the Word of God, this book, this isn't something I found. This is something that was already there. I just recognized it. This is something God did. So once again, it's just I marvel at this book. I marvel at what God has done in history and just the perfect pattern that's been set up from the beginning. It's just amazing. So anyway, let's take a break with that, and we'll meet back here in about five or ten minutes. Where did it die? I was just going through Wilsonville, and it just dropped down. Oh, okay. My battery died. Oh, no. So I, I have to... It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to get into the doctor of the door. It sounded like that's where you were going. I, my mind was, but I knew I had to stop myself. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise.